Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today we're coming to you from the Eves Movie Ranch in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, we're here because we're shooting a short film to prove or disprove the power of Anthem One Light. The thing is, when you say yes, sometimes you get these incredible gifts like this guy. This is Carl Gottlieb, probably the greatest screenwriter you've never heard of. Carl, do you want to tell the YouTube audience what kind of movies you've done? Well, if I was a Jeopardy category, it would be his hits begin with a J. Uh, <laughs> I wrote uh, I share screenplay credit with Peter Benchley on Jaws. Then I did The Jerk with Steve Martin. There's your two J's right there. And then I did Which Way's Up with Richard Pryor and Dr. Detroit with Dan Aykroyd and Caveman, which I also directed. I but what about your big films? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, I think uh, Jaws is number two uh, horror film of all time. Yes, Psycho's number one. Yeah. And we were talking the other day at lunch, and you had a, a quick little anecdote yes, about when, that when, ranking. When, when uh, Stephen asked me for my opinion on the script, uh, I wrote a long memo, and I said at one point, uh, you know, if we do our jobs right, people will feel about going in the water the way they feel about taking a shower after Psycho. And lo and behold, here we are 40-something years later, and whenever I'm introduced to somebody and I tell them or someone tells them, you know, he wrote Jaws, they go, oh, you know, I saw that movie. I didn't go in the water for you. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But I, I don't go, I know, I know, I know. I say, oh, yes, I know. That, 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 what a burden. Many, many, people have that, <laughs> many people have had that reaction. One of the reasons why I'm so stoked to have Carl here is because as that great Shakespearean philosopher, Clint Eastwood, in his role as dirty Harry Callahan said, a man has to know his limitations. And as I grow older, I find I know less and less and less. And it's not because I'm forgetting. No. So to learn that someone of this talent is here, available, and uh, likes the same kind of breakfast that I do, is a real treat. And I wanted to share with you that he is very much still active and I hold him in the highest regard. Let's start with how you got into this business. Well, I, you know, I, I was a class clown and I liked being funny and I drifted into improvisational theater first as a stage manager and then as an actor. And as an actor in an improvisational company called The Committee, we were playing in Los Angeles after a long run in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, Tommy Smothers from the Smothers Brothers saw the show and they were staffing up for a new season. And they hired a bunch of the young kid writers, comedy guys. There's me, Steve Martin, Bob Einstein, uh, Murray Roman, McLean Stevenson, not so funny, but there he was. Uh, Lorenzo Music, who created Rhoda and Newhart. Wow. And that was the writing staff. And John Hartford, a great you know, singer-songwriter uh, who wrote Glenn Campbell's biggest hit. Uh, and we all got our Writers Guild cards on that show. And then one thing led to another. I did comedy variety for a while. At the time that I left uh, L.A. to do Jaws, uh, I was uh, story editor of The Odd Couple with Tony Randall and Jack Klugman doing my comedy thing. And then after I finished Jaws, I went back to television. I did four Flip Wilson specials. Well, you know, it's, it's fascinating because you can't possibly cover in the time that we've allotted ourselves the, the full richness and depth of your background. But I think there are going to be many people who actually don't know who the Smothers Brothers were or how much it represented the zeitgeist. So can you talk about the Smothers Brothers, in particular 1968, please? Well, the Smothers Brothers... Uh were an iconoclastic duo. Uh, Tommy had a, a pretty raised consciousness when it came to politics, uh, and they were uh, favorites of, of Mid-America. And when the show went on the air a couple of years earlier, it knocked Bonanza out of the top 10. One of the great Westerns of all time. Yes, when they, when they, still, when they still made Westerns. Anyway, uh, the Smothers Brothers were uh, a duo. Uh, the Comedy was contemporary and uh, political, and when we won the Emmy with that show, we knocked off Laugh-In, which had won the Comedy Variety Musical Emmy for a couple of years running before that. 
Now, both of those shows were live TV, as I recall. Uh, well, live on tape. They, they live would, on tape. They, they would. Thank uh, you. They would tape them in front of a live audience, and very close to air date. Uh, but there was still time to edit a little bit, not much, en enough to censor the show if the CBS wanted to do that, <laughs> which they did. They did. They did. I mean, 1968 was a pivotal year in American politics. Indeed, uh, one of the network's objections was. Uh, Harry Belafonte was a guest on the show singing Don't Stop the Carnival, and in the background we were running footage of the police riots in Chicago. That was also the year that Chuck Braverman did the two-minute year in review, yes. which was an extraordinary piece of work. I think he was cutting every, something like every half second and had put together just this incredible video montage or film montage. It was actually filmed back in those days. But this is another place where it's six degrees of separation because he had done work for Apple Music before then, the Beatles, and you have a connection to the Beatles as well. Yes, I, I, uh, I directed a Beatle. Uh, I wrote uh, a comedy called Caveman with, with uh, Rudy DeLuca, and then I directed it, and my star was, was Ringo Starr, and it was on that picture <laughs> where he met his wife, Barbara Bach, so I'm a matchmaker to the stars. A shidduch, there yes, you go. And, I, and uh, that's not my only matchmaking adventure on, on uh, Dr. Detroit, where I, I worked with Dan Aykroyd, and that's where he met and eventually married Donna Dixon. Something about you. Well, so, something about the people. I, I, I write and make them so attractive that women fall over themselves. It's a gift. It's just a <laughs> gift. So. I think what I want to do is, I want to cover so much with you, but this is an episode of What Were You Thinking? And we'd had lunch together yesterday, and I was asking him all kinds of questions, big regrets, what would you have done differently? And really what came out of that conversation, I'll just cut to the chase on this one, is that Carl has had an extraordinarily fortunate life. I, I can't complain. Uh, I went from one job to another. The jobs got better. In there was the fish movie and the jerk, you know, icon iconic films. And you can't plan that. You can't say, what I really want to do is make an iconic film that will be, you know, still current 50 years later. Uh, you know, when they made Casablanca, they didn't know they were doing that. That was a B film. Yes. yes. And, 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 uh, and I don't compare the fish movie to Casablanca, but they have an equally long life and a, a, a great, long tail. Get it? Yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. a great uh, attraction for film scholars and uh, their great performances. So, uh, yeah, and you can't plan that. That just happens. You, you, we don't tell the audience what's a hit. They tell us. Great point. Great point. Well, as we discussed so many things yesterday, there was one moment. It was an inflection point for you. You were already successful on TV. You'd come back to TV, as you'd said. You also uh, worked on The Name of the Game, which was a show that I loved. Oh, yeah. With uh, Tony, what is it, Franciosa and I think so, Gene yeah. Barry. But the inflection point that I, I want to go to, the, the question that I want to ask you is, when you were sitting down with Steven Spielberg, Yes, Richard Zanuck and David Brown and okay. Stephen were having breakfast, and Stephen had uh, shown them the memo that I wrote to him. He had sent me the script, um, you know, eviscerate it, he wrote on the cover. Which is quite extraordinary yeah. and a gift to a writer. Yes. So I wrote a, a, a long memo and sent it to him, and then he discussed it with Zanuck and Brown, and they said, well, can we get him over here to talk to us? So I got a call like at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, uh, and can you come over to the Bel Air Hotel and meet us? So I pulled on my pants and drove over to Bel Air Hotel. And That's we too much information. Bag ba we had bagels, little cream cheese, and lox, and we talked about the fish movie, and I talked about you know where the script was deficient and where I, I thought it needed work. And the upshot, and it was a long meeting. It went through three, three meals. It went through breakfast, a snack, and then high tea. But it was, it was dark when I, by the time I left. Um, and they said, well, we'll, we'll We'll call your agent. And the next morning, it was Monday morning, they called the agent. They made an offer. 
uh, and it was three weeks before principal photography. Now, normally you don't do a major rewrite on a film three weeks before starting. But with the enthusiasm of youth, uh, Stephen and I just took the script apart, crafted a new outline, cut subplots out, added a few things, and, and uh, then I started writing so that there would have pages to shoot on the first day of photography, which was by that time 15 days away, 14 days, 13, 12, we're counting. And, and so we made the movie. I was Some days I was just writing uh, you know, eight hours ahead of the schedule. I'd finish at midnight. They would, Zanuck or, or, Zanuck or Brown uh, would read the pages. And Stephen and I were sharing a house so I could just shove them under the bedroom door. And Up say, in Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and six o'clock in the morning, they'd call the office staff to come in early and mimeograph the pages for that day's shooting. Other days we had a week ahead, you know, a week's lead time. Oh boy, luxury. So there are two things that I, I want to say about that, and then I want to ask my question. Um, one is that you subsequently... I have Siri relationship issues, oh. even when I turn off the phone. It just drives me nuts. The, the first thing that I, I want to circle back to is this was incredible pressure, but you said that there are two types of writers, and you seem to be ideally suited for the kind of writer that Steven Spielberg, Zanuck, and Brown needed. Could you just share that those two types? Yeah, there, there are habitual writers who wake up in the morning and have to write. You know, if, if they're on a job, that's great. The job gets completed on time. Uh, if they're not, you know, working, they're making notes, they're doing a novel, they're writing a screenplay speculatively. They just, like, have to write. Stephen King is a great example. And the result of that is you get an author with a great body of work because they just churn it out, and if they're geniuses, even better. We all, we all benefit. The other kind of writer, besides the habitual writer, is uh, moi, <laughs> uh, the deadline writer. Yeah. I'm a writer for hire. I write when I get paid. Yeah. If I'm not paid, I generally don't write. And sometimes I don't write even if I am being paid, and then <laughs> my wife or my bank or my agent say, excuse me, you know, they're waiting, and then I sit down and finish whatever it is that I'm doing. So the, the thing that I just want you guys to be aware of is that after you did the Fish movie, at some point after the Fish movie, you wrote a book about your experience. And I want to make sure that people know about it because it's an inside look of one of the greatest movies of all time. A movie that you reminded me yesterday was probably the last of the great studio movies. Yeah, it was, a, it was in all ways a studio film, uh, with the exception of the special effects department, because the Universal Studios special effects department yeah. were busy with the big movies of that year, you know, Earthquake and Hindenburg. Uh, <laughs> so, so we got uh, to build the shark off the lot. And we brought a special effects guy named Bob Maddy out of retirement. And his qualification for the job was that he had designed the giant squid that Kirk Douglas struggled with in uh, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea oh for Disney. Oh my God, Jules so, Verne. Yes. That's right. Yes. So Bob Maddy built the squid, so naturally he was the guy to build the shark. And Joe Alves, the production designer, had designed the perfect shark. And uh, Bob Maddy worked out how to build it and make it appear to swim and bite. Tell people where the name of the book and where they can buy it oh, because well, it's it's really just a course. wonderful a wonderful resource for anyone who is a student of the film industry. Yes, yeah, so the, the the blurbs on the cover from Steven Soderbergh and Rob Reiner. You're and such a Ryan braggart. Singer. Yes, yes. Uh, they all blurbed the book, as they say, and the book. For those of you who've been waiting anxiously for the title, it's called The Jaws Log, by Carl Gottlieb. Uh, Harper Collins, okay, and and international editions, and it's the best-selling movie about a uh, best best-selling book about a movie ever, and that includes movies that have surpassed Jaws at the box office, but there are no books like like mine, the Jaws log. Beautiful. All right. So now I want to ask my question. At this meeting at the Bel Air Hotel. Sorry. I'm, I, I am having so much trouble with you. Do you have relationship issues with Siri? Okay. That meeting, it was an inflection point 
in your career, what were you thinking as that meeting was unfolding? Did you have a sense that this would change your life? Did you have a sense of panic because the stakes were so high? Or were you more thinking like, would you please pass the ketchup? It was, it was more of like a, uh, you know, where do you find a writer on a Sunday morning? Oh, Carl's available. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and I'd already I'd read the script in its uh, present iteration at that point. I mean, it was a flawed script. Uh, uh, Peter Benchley was not a screenwriter, and he had written the first draft. And then uh, and the book, of course, for those who don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, it's an adaptation of a best-selling novel. And then an, a subsequent writer had done a more professional job on it. And I, sh I should give a mention here because he, he receives no credit and very little mention. Uh, Howard Sackler, who wrote The Great White Hope and Grey Lady Down, had done a pass at the script, but that script was not the one that Stephen wanted to shoot. Gotcha. And so we had to make something different. But my, my feeling at the meeting was just, well, you know, I've been talking to Stephen about this movie, so I might as well talk to these other guys. They're the ones who are going to have to make the movie. I didn't think I was going to be involved in it. I just was giving the benefit of my Vast analysis. Experience. My, yeah. my, my, that, that wasn't wasn't a lot of experience at that point. That was my first produced film. I had written other scripts, but that was my first produced film. Um, and knowing that it was going to be produced was a huge incentive for me to walk away from my television job. Which on, you did, yeah. For 24 the, hours notice. Yeah. I was writing a uh, story editor for The Odd Couple with Jack Klugman and, and uh, right. Tony Randall over at ABC Paramount. And I had to go in... I don't think I even went in. I said, I called in and said, I, I'm going to make a movie in Martha's Vineyard. I'll see you when I get back. <laughs> and, off I, and off I went on the adventure of a lifetime. Well, Carl, I know you can't spend that much time here. You've got a, a car coming to pick you up in a little bit. I could actually stay for days. Really, I could. Let's send out for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, Carl Gottlieb, and again, the, the joy of serendipity. I, I had no expectation that I would meet someone with this kind of background. The interesting thing is, you never know. He was just a guy. I didn't pay any attention to you. I'm sure you paid no attention to me, which is still appropriate. But, but then... I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you will. But then Justin says, Justin Evans says, you must talk to Carl. You guys are going to have so much to talk about. And it is just a wonderful thing. What's also wonderful is that as much as one grows older, one becomes more aware of what one doesn't know. All of your writing skill is right here, right now, and you're still, you're still doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving here to go to a meeting in downtown Santa Fe about a script that I'm rewriting about the Vietnam War. It's called Rock and Load. And it's a, a, a personal memoir of a guy who was in a band that went to Vietnam to play as a band, got shot at, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a great line, they got, you know, uh, shot at and missed, shit on and hit. <laughs> uh, but they got, they got through it intact, they played their music, they were flying in and out of combat zones, landing at forward fire bases, doing a show for 40 artillerymen and then getting back in the chopper and doing another show somewhere down the line. Uh, they got bronze stars and came back alive and stayed together as a band for another 40 years. I want so much to talk politics with you. We don't have the time to do that. It's forbidden subject in the officer's mess, politics, religion, and women. Yes, fortunately we're not in the mess. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that we can reconnect and we can get into that because quite apart from your skill, as a writer, you've lived a very full life, you've seen a lot of things, and it would be a shame if we couldn't delve into that as well. Sure. Carl, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was good for me too. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Gottlieb, everyone, for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, perfect timing, it's starting to rain. See you next time.